Well, hello and welcome to this evening's event from Jesus College and the Intellectual Forum. My name is Julian Huffett, and I have the great pleasure of uh, being director of the Intellectual Forum here at Jesus College, uh, which you can see part of behind me on a, a slightly sunnier day. Uh, some of you will know Jesus very well. Um, some of you, this may be your first time coming to one of our events, and you're, you're very welcome wherever you are and whether you've been here before or not. Um, the college was originally set up as a nunnery in 1144, became a college in 1496, and over the last 800 and something years has had an amazing range of people who have helped to really drive thinking in many, many different directions. The Intellectual Forum is more recent. We were set up in 2016 to try to help develop some of that thinking to reach out beyond the boundaries of our college. So it is really, really good to have you here with us. Tonight, we're going to be talking about freedom of information. We're going to be looking at how it can be used and a little bit of the history of how it has, has developed in the UK and in the US particularly. Uh, in many ways, it was a great achievement. Uh, some of us see the freedom of information legislation as one of the best things that Tony Blair did. Tony Blair, sadly, described it as one of the most foolish things that he did. He described himself as an idiot, a naive, foolish, irresponsible nincompoop. Um, now, personally, I think it was far from the worst thing uh, that Tony Blair did, but it's slightly interesting and alarming that he was so concerned. We have three speakers here uh, to talk to uh, with us about this. Uh, we'll hear from them for about 10 minutes each, and then we'll have time for Q&A. And if you do have any questions, please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You're probably familiar with it by now, and we'll come on to those questions later. Uh, as you should have seen, we are recording this, uh, so people will be able to watch uh, all of this later. So our speakers are firstly, uh, Maurice Frankel. Um, Maurice has been working the campaign for freedom of information uh, since 1984, appropriately enough, uh, and has been hugely influential in changing uh, the legal system here and bringing about the laws that we have. We're then going to hear from uh, Gary Ruskin, who is the executive director of US Right to Know. Uh, he, as you might guess, is based in the US and has used FOI there uh, and the UK and elsewhere, particularly looking at the food, chemical and ag agricultural industries. And it's great to have, to have him. And then finally, we have one of our own, uh, Dr. Sarah Steele. So Sarah is a senior research associate in Cambridge Public Health and has used FOI a huge amount there, as we all hear. She's also the deputy director of the Intellectual Forum here, here at Jesus. So I'm not sure if I get to invite my own deputy uh, to this event. Um, you won't be hearing very much from me. Some of you will be very pleased uh, to know that. But I would just flag up that as well as running this place, I'm also a director of the Joseph Rowntree Reform Trust, an organization which has been trying to make particularly Britain a better place since 1904. And in particular, we funded the campaign for freedom of information for quite a while. So there, 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 there is a strong connection here. So having had probably more than you wanted from me, can I now hand over to Morris to start us off? Thank you, Julian. Um, well, uh, I'm just going to start by giving um, a few examples of how, how freedom of information has been used in the UK um, and the change in, it in, in a sense that it's brought about because we now start from the assumption that people do have a right to know what a public authority is doing, whereas previously that was treated as the authority's private business and people who try to know were regarded as uh, in, intruding into matters which didn't concern them. So we had a very early uh, example when there was a, uh, a, a climate change demonstration um, about a uh, then proposed coal, new coal-fired power station uh, in the UK. And it turns out that um, the cost of this, um, just in terms of the policing, was almost six million pounds. And um, when a minister was questioned about the justification for this uh, spending, he said 70 police officers had been injured in the course of policing the demonstration. 
Now, somebody had the inspired idea of making a freedom of information request to the police force concerned for the injuries treated by their mobile medical unit at the demonstration. And the response showed that uh, the medical unit had dealt mainly with uh, cases of toothache, diarrhea, cut fingers, possible bee stings, and a police officer had injured his leg climbing over a fence to get their football back. There, there was no injury caused by protesters, and a minister had to come back to Parliament to apologise for misleading Parliament in the original statement. So that's an indication of um, the kind of disclosure uh, that would never have happened prior to freedom of information. Um, and we have others which are similar to that. For example, um, uh, some years ago, there was a parliamentary question about how many um, people detained at the Yarls Wood uh, Immigration Detention Centre uh, had been injured as a result of self-harm because people were suicidal, basically, in the context of that place. The parliamentary question was, there had been no serious incidents in the last two years. A freedom of information request which followed that showed that in one of the two years, there had been 74 incidents requiring medical attention. So again, it's bringing a new tool uh, to bear in the interest of accountability, government accountability, uh, which goes beyond what Parliament itself um, can very often uh, provide. Now, it's used in all kinds of different circumstances. It's a survey tool very often. And there's an example of uh, three or four years ago in which uh, doctors were who are required to be on call during a rotation. They were required to be on call at the hospital during the night and had to be able to, to, to get to the hospital in a very short time. Now, many of them lived too far away from the hospital to get there in time. And so they'd have to take a, they'd have to stay at the hospital overnight. And many of them were being charged for staying at the hospital. And a doctor used the Freedom of Information Act to find out what the charges were. Um, and they ranged from nine pounds to 65 pounds a night. And that in a year, a doctor might have to pay um, um, 11, uh, 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 over 1,100 pounds in charges to stay at their hospital where they were required to be available by their contract. And as a result of the survey, the British Medical Association, which is the body which negotiates terms on behalf of doctors, uh, negotiated a new contract which did not permit charges to be made to doctors for accommodation in these circumstances. Um, now, the, the final example I want to give you is um, one that was used by a specialised organisation campaigning to make the National Health Service safer. They're called um, Action for Action Against Medical Accidents. And um, they had uh, discovered that uh, an agency of the Department of Health, when a, when a new hazard was discovered uh, resulting from um, a medical product or device, uh, this agency circulated a safety alert to all national health trusts, warning them of the hazard, telling them what action to take, and asking them to let the agency know when the trust had taken that action. Uh, and this charity had uh, the brilliant idea of asking the agency for, there were 53 alerts at the time, for the number of trusts which had not reported that they had taken the required action and the names of those trusts. And um, they, the figures showed that 75% of all trusts had failed to comply with at least one of these uh, safety alerts. 80 trusts had failed to comply with 10 or more, and the worst had failed to comply with 70% of these alerts. Now, they, they press released this with each 
a separate press release in each area, putting the local uh, hospital and trust at the, in the headline. Um, and it caused quite a storm. And the following year, they did a follow-up request and the number of trusts failing to comply with at least one alert had gone down from 75% to 50%. The number of trusts failing to comply with 10 or more alerts had gone from 80 to five. And the worst offender had gone from failing to comply with 37 out of 53 alerts to failing to comply with 14. So there'd actually been a massive improvement in compliance with these safety alerts. Now, this, this charity was actually disappointed that they hadn't eliminated non-compliance altogether. But I think most other people would have been impressed with the substantial improvement that this single FOI request had helped to bring about. Uh, because um, just the, the releasing the information itself wasn't enough, but releasing the information um, with effective publicity and campaigning had made a great impact. And so it's an indication of the power of the Freedom of Information Act. Um, which any person can use. You don't have to go to a member of parliament or a councillor or any intermediate body. Anyone can use this themselves. There are normally no charges for making requests. Um, and the, in fact, the only charge that can be made under the Freedom of Information Act is for printing, photocopying, um, and postage. And virtually no public authorities uh, make those charges because the cost of generating an invoice and checking whether it had been paid would usually um, exceed the value of the money they were trying to recover and simply place extra burden on freedom of information officers, which they weren't keen uh, to have. So unlike some countries' freedom of information laws, um, ours is largely free of charge. But the quid pro quo for that is we have a cost limit. So where a public authority estimates that basically the time needed to find the requested information would exceed particular limits. And that is the equivalent of um, 24 hours or uh, 600 pounds for a government department. And um, 18 hours or um, 450 pounds for most other public authorities with a reasonable estimate of the costs uh, is that they would exceed those limits. The authority is not required to reply at all. And so in return for uh, free access to information, what we have is a provision which allows authorities to reject requests which are too costly. And that turns out to be a major obstacle uh, to access, um, mainly because if somebody makes a request for information uh, which is monitored centrally and where the figures already exist, the cost of finding that information is negligible and doesn't trigger this cost limit. But if the figures have to be extracted from a series of manually held files, which is very often the case, or they have to be extracted from a large number of emails and they have to be opened and checked to make sure that they are actually on target, then the costs shoot up. And very often uh, the request can be refused because of the cost limit. And so this is, uh, a real challenge for people making requests because you don't know how the authority organizes its files, what its indexing is like, uh, how long it's going to take to find information. And this is a great problem. Now, uh, authorities are under a statutory duty to provide reasonable advice and assistance to requesters, particularly in this situation where uh, the cost limit uh, would be exceeded. But unfortunately, they very often the advice is not good enough to allow somebody to decide by how much to narrow the scope of their request. And so this is one of the problems uh, that people using the Act have in the UK. 
Um, and a second problem are the delays in the whole system, because quite often the public authority takes, although they're meant to respond within 20 working days to the request, um, they are entitled to take extra time when um, their information could be withheld under an exemption, and that exemption is subject to public interest test. Now, this is a particularly good aspect of the Act because it says that even exempt information may have to be disclosed if on balance the public interest in disclosure equals or exceeds the public interest in withholding the information. Um, but they get extra time to deal with that and that sometimes uh, uh, causes uh, a additional delay, and you see public authorities using that provision repeatedly, although they're not meant to. And on top of that, there can be, there very often are delays in uh, getting a complaint. They then have to go through internal review. So if you're unhappy with a request which has been refused, you have to ask the authorities to reconsider. There's no statutory time limit on that. There's guidance from the Information Commissioner. Uh, so that's a second source of delay. And the third source is the Information Commissioner is very often has a large backlog of complaints to deal with. And so you can wait several months before your complaint reaches a point at which the Commissioner is, is ready to investigate. So that is the a second big problem in getting information in time to make use to make use of it and make effective use of it. So that's really the dilemma we have, which I think is common with many FOI regimes, that the delay uh, tends to undermine the effectiveness of what would otherwise be uh, quite good legislation. So I think I've had my 10 minutes and I'm going to stop um, just there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Morris, and, and really interesting to see those really good examples of just changing behaviour. It's not just getting information. It's not just a sort of journalism, transparency piece. It's actually doing something. Um, and there are those interesting questions about what are the right safeguards? Um, how do you make sure that authorities make things easier? You don't want them to make it make it easier to hide things by making your systems complicated. That's, that's yeah. not the sort of incentive we want. So yeah. some things that we may want to come back to. and. Uh, do put questions using the Q&A feature. I see one already. You can do them by your name or anonymously if you prefer. Um, but for now, can we hand over to Gary? Do you want to talk a bit about uh, the US example um, and what you've been doing uh, using this as well? Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Julian. I'm, I'm delighted to be on this panel because now is a great time to use our world's freedom of information laws to advance the public good. So why is it a great time? Well, there are a lot of reasons. So let's talk about them. First, Many of the institutions that used to carry out investigations for the public good are, are weakening. In the United States and in much of the world, investigative journalism is on the decline. Journalism is, in general is crashing in the United States and many other places, but investigative journalism even, even more so and more tragically so. Um, because it's expensive to do compared to other forms of journalism and often powerful groups like advertisers and public officials just hate it. And so there are fewer investigative journalists around who, who do FOIA work, uh, FOI work. Also, back in the 1960s and 70s, it, it used to be that the U.S. Congress and to a lesser extent state legislatures um, conducted investigations for the public good, whether on consumer or environmental or public health issues but such investigations are growing increasingly rare. And then uh, we also see the rise of the obfuscation industry or what's not more commonly known as public relations. Some estimates now suggest that public relations people outnumber um, journalists by a ratio of six to one. And one of the most important functions of public relations firms these days is to preempt and defang and to bury journalistic investigations of corporate wrongdoing. And since, since there are now so many PR staffers compared to journalists, the balance of power is really tipped quite sharply to the obfuscation industry. So, so as the world grows more and more complex, there are fewer investigative resources chasing many, if not more instances of harm to citizens, to consumers, to the environment or to public health. And so with that as a background, that it, it's clear that there is a lot of opportunity to do FOI work for the public good. And to me, the gap between investigative resources and the public's uh, investigative need um, 
is enormous and it's growing. And that means that there are many issue areas where someone could be conducting an FOI investigation, but nobody really is. So you could do it. Uh, you really could. And so let's talk about what sorts of public problems uh, FOIs are good for. They, they, they tend to be especially good and especially useful for uncovering situations where you suspect co corporate or government wrongdoing, where either corporate or government wrongdoing appears or appears to be an element of the problem. That, that, that's true for so many environmental, consumer, uh, public health uh, problems. FOIs is, are... Uh, may be especially use, useful where the wrongdoing is longstanding, uh, a longstanding kind of intractable problem. They're especially good for long-term problems because sometimes it does take months, if not years, to get your data set back. And, and on occasion, data sets can be 100,000 pages or more. And so it, it takes time both to get the data set and then you have to analyze them. FOIs may also be especially useful in helping to understand hidden power dynamics, the exercise of influence or abuse of power or political corruption. Uh, oftentimes, uh, FOIs will be the only way that you can understand and document any of these public problems or, or perhaps the only way uh, along with talking to whistleblowers. But of course, in many situations, whistleblowers may not be available, though it's sure is great when they are. Um, one great thing about FOIs is what they produce, and that is often evidence, documentary evidence, evidence that can form the basis of academic or magazine or newspaper articles, you or even litigation or legislation or even prosecution. I've been doing public interest work for 36 years, and in my experience, the rate limiting step for making change um, is so often the busting out of new information out of corporate and government filing cabinets and making it public. If you can do that, sometimes you really can change public opinion, generate lots of news coverage, pass laws, make a real difference. I've seen this time and time again in my life, and that's why the investigative process and the use of FOIs are so tactically important if you want to make our world, world a better place. So uh, there are so many different types of public problems where the FOI is a worthy tactic. Those problems are just waiting for you to file uh, your FOIs and to investigate. Let's, let's get into details a little bit about what it takes to write an FOI. In most countries and jurisdictions that I have worked in, you don't need a lawyer to draft your FOI. You can write them yourself. And one thing I personally love about the FOI process is just the joy of being surprised. The, the world we inhabit is so much more complex and interesting and subtle than what we can typically imagine in our own heads. And so when you conduct an investigation using, using your FOIs, you may have some sense or hypothesis in mind, of, say, about the power dynamics that you're trying to understand. But what's so great about FOI is that when you do get back a data set, I find there's almost always surprises. And sometimes they're even really great jaw-dropping surprises. It's really wonderful to receive these surprises and to learn how, how the world really works, which is often so different from how we think it may work in our own heads. And so in, in other words, any, any day you get a new FOIA data set, it's like Christmas, you unwrap the package and almost always there's that unexpected right, right there in, in your hands. What a great feeling. So what do you have to be to file an FOI? Well, you don't have to have a PhD, you don't have to, have a, you don't have to be a lawyer, you don't have to be a journalist, you don't have to be utterly brilliant, I'm certainly not. You don't have to have read 100 books or anything like that to, about the problem. Um, the truth is that most FOIs are, are not hard to write, yes, you have to write in the right format and you have to assert a search query or a set of search queries and you, you have to know who to send your FOI to and if it, it helps if you follow up. But none of these are, things are really so hard. You can do them and if I can do them, you can do them. Your first FOI is often the hardest one to write. It's harder the first time because you don't know the ropes quite yet. And sometimes it does take a teeny bit of courage to do it. The good news is that there are usably, usually kind of serviceable templates that you can use and adapt and work from. And I think you'll find that when you write your second one, 
it's easier than the first. And as you do it more and more, you'll get better at it and it'll get easier. I know in my heart, because I've seen it with my own eyes so many times that we as citizens can use the power of the FOI to protect the environment, uncover corruption, save lives, expose scandals, vindicate our right to know and do so much more for the public good. I have an old friend who's been a journalist for more than 60 years now. He says uh, it's more important to be able to ask a good question than it is to be able to answer it. And in my experience, he's absolutely right. Um, the role of the question asker is profound. The impact of the question asker can be profound. And um, so FOIs are a great way to ask questions, to be a good, to ask a good question. You don't need to know the answer. You just need to be able to wonder about it. And so whether you're an academic or a researcher or an advocate or a campaigner or just a person who cares about our world and worries about uh, the world our children and our grandchildren are growing up in, I hope you'll give some thought and consideration to, use, to using the, the tactic of, of filing FOIs to advance the public good. Um, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, really interesting again, and, and that idea there that it's exciting that actually finding out, you know, that there's a real enthusiasm. And I think the other thing is just how easy it is to use FOI. So thank you very much, Gary, and, and, and for that perspective. And it's great to see so many questions coming in and, and please do uh, bring more in. Um, and now, Sarah, over to you to talk about your experiences. Hello, everybody. So as, as Julian has kindly introduced me, I am a researcher based here at the University of Cambridge and Deputy Director of the Intellectual Forum. In my research, which is really in um, public health and gender-based violence and trying to attend to real social issues. I've used FOIs as a method to collect data, to look at whether people are implementing policies across bodies like the NHS in the way that they should be. But I'd also say I've used freedom of information requests as a parent and as a citizen and engaged with others who are using these at a very kind of individual level or at a social level to kind of see improvements in everything from access to um, cycling areas that are appropriate for people with children and disabilities and things like that all the way through to looking at large scale data sets to understand influences on political processes, nutritional guidelines, all of these sorts of things. So I wanted to kind of give a few examples of some of the successes of FOIs that I've done um, with the teams I've worked with and some of the problems and pitfalls I've discovered and faced and how those tie to those who are in the wider community wanting to do things for socially impactful reasons or because they're frustrated with a cycle gate for one of those kind of weird crossing moments and you want to address the fact that something is inhibiting you or inhibiting different people within a society. So I kind of want to give those examples. So the first one I really wanted to kind of unpack and give you all pertains to a study I wanted to do on whether the NHS had adequate sexual harassment policies and training. So one of the things that I know we have all kind of talked about, it opposed me to movement. There's been a lot of discussion about workplace harassment. There'd been a lot of impetus to make a more equal, more fair and more safe society specifically with addressing these issues that do disproportionately affect women and girls, although not always women and girls. And so what we kind of wanted to understand was what training was going on, what policies were put in place, what was being done within the NHS. Now, some of you may have seen some of the outputs of that and some of the collaborations we've had and some of the advice we've given to the Guardian, it was featured here in the UK. Those of you who read The Guardian may have seen a, a, an extensive spread on this. And there was a great collaboration of researchers, journalists, and the BMJ. So with that background of the BMA and, and interest from a, a representative union. And what we've done is a multi-year sort of thing, some disconnected, some very strategically planned, but what we wanted to look at was really some different aspects from different perspectives of what was, do, what was being done. Were there clear policies that say this behaviour is unacceptable and no patient, no staff member, no visitor, no volunteer should experience these things when they're interacting with the nation's healthcare service? 
We also wanted to look at the data of what incidents there'd be. Some people were really interested in if you have a policy in place, does that reduce the number of incidents, increase the number of incidents? What does it actually do in that institution? And then another part of that was looking at, are we adequately training our staff and all our volunteers and all these people to prevent this and to intervene and so that people show awareness and report? And we wanted to look at all those aspects. To do that in many ways, you can't do that with one freedom of information request. So it was very much multiple parties taking little slices of that pie in their own unique ways for their own purposes to try and understand all of what was going on. For my purpose, what I wanted to know, particularly for my personal research area, was about training. I wanted to know that we were actually teaching people. We can't kind of just expect to say, don't do this and not give them the skills and equipment to actually be able to meaningfully address that and, and, and act collegially or in an environment to say that behavior is not acceptable. So I wanted to look at what training we were offering. So I sent a freedom of information request to every single NHS trust in the UK. It's surprisingly quick to do. The core thing is to make sure you're asking for something because as Morris said, you've got to be quite limited within the um, accepted number of hours as well as the cost. So it was about cultivating something that was clear, precise and went to the heart of that training. It was also about making that accessible to others. So I often also just recommend people look at websites like What Do They Know? and those sorts of websites where you can send FOIs. And one of the great things about those resources is you can look at freedom of information requests that have worked for people before. So what you can do is go and look at what got a response, what's about rights for what I can request. And you can learn from other people's mistakes and you can also see and learn from good practice. And so for me, those sites have been really helpful. And it's also let me uncover other questions that other people I may not know yet are actually asking. And sometimes we've been able to make contact and, and share the data that we found. The other things that people have done is use that to collate very clear data across the whole of the NHS. For example, trying to test and look at which trusts have higher levels and lower levels. So literally numbers. What I found with that is that you have to make very clear and precise definitions of what data you're asking for. And you've also got to acknowledge that some of that, that information that comes back to you, especially when you ask for numbers, may be a bit murky or muddy and it may not be understandable. So you do have to be prepared in this process to go back and make clarifications. And certainly sometimes I've got numbers of incidents where people have chosen a different way of reporting it than I've asked for. And you sometimes have to go back and ask to make that coherent so you can do those comparisons. But I also said to you that I've used this beyond my kind of professional and research role where I've been collating that data and trying to understand policy to practice and what training we do. I've also used this as a parent. I've wanted to know how during COVID, for example, when children were in schools, how different schools in my local area were or were not implementing the kind of unclear government guidance at the time around meals and free school meals in that setting. And what were the different practices? What were they sending to parents? Was this coherent across a local authority or worse? children, quite frankly, in lower socioeconomic settings within the local authority environment, worse off by their provision. And I really wanted to know, as a parent, what was the general policies and procedures? Did this marry up to what was happening in my son's school? And freedom of information requests were able to look at what the local authority was sending out. We also gathered by freedom of information requests an understanding of the different schools, policies, procedures, and communications. And we were able to look at the fact that there was vastly different requirements being put on parents across cities beyond the top-down government direct provision for particularly low-income families. For those families who didn't qualify for free school meals, but did 
um, generally get subsidized meals, there was a great differentiation in what was the advice of different schools within the local authority. And there was very different understandings of what applied to asylum seeker families and for some of those most marginalized in society. So we detected some significant equity issues we were also able to talk to head teachers and flag different government policies they weren't aware of by sending an FOI and then coming back going, oh my gosh, we don't understand this. What does this mean? There was actually an educative process for those schools. And I think that's really it, that FOIs can both gather information for you to do impactful things. We've talked, Gary and I have mentioned research, campaigning, advocacy, all of those things. But also we do see real changes when you send the request. So I want to give you an example that's not per se my own, but one that I think that really highlights just how an individual can have such an impactful use of this particular device, that the FOI itself. And that's that for those who are outside the UK, some of the things I may be saying, I just want to clarify, I'll, I'll kind of specify them and, and give you a bit of a fudge around it. But the Equality Act here requires that disabled people are not disadvantaged by a particular practice. So that has implications for workplaces, but it also applies in the kind of public space. So, for example, in streets, councils here, so the local authorities, local government, have to ensure that access is easy for disabled people as it is for anyone else. So persons with a disability need to be able to use routes, including things like cycle routes, and they need to be able to be able to get past certain things. And what we've found is, for example, there's been use of gates and use of um, things like changes to cycle routes and, and kind of passing areas where an adapted bike, a tricycle or something like that would not fit through the space allowed. That creates basically a barrier to access. And so there's been a lot of use of FOIs to make sure that the relevant authorities confirm that they complied with the Equality Act in their implementation of that, and that they carried out something called an equality impact assessment. So that looks at how they will make allowances and accommodations for those who need them. Now, I want to kind of acknowledge and, and, and now sadly passed request maker by the name of heavy metal hand cyclist, who some of you may or may not have come across, who provided a template that was well circulated on Twitter, now X, um, which is an excellent example of how one can use something like what do they know to affect some change. So obstructive barriers have been put in Warrington and it was not getting anywhere like talking to the local authority. Those ill-placed barriers um, when a FOI request was made and a request was made to say, had all those processes been followed, in the response, the local authority identified that in light of that, they would be removing them. We've also seen that kind of catalytic effect of that FOI being so effective at the council going, oops, no, we didn't, we've got to remove these, leading to a, a kind of more, a greater stream in that kind of cycling space of the use of these FOIs. So we've had people with mobility scooters, um, different kind of cycling devices, people that have a range of different needs in terms of things who've challenged poorly placed bollards, posts, barriers, all manner, manner of things. And to use the freedom of information request to make sure the process had been followed, which evidently it hadn't if that barrier was there, and to facilitate constructive engagement with the local authority where they hadn't responded to polite letters. By using freedom of information requests, it's simply available to flag that policies and practices haven't been followed in a very clear and public way to highlight the issues about a path being impassable to wider people and also to kind of allow any person affected by this to effectively ask a public authority to consider what they have done, to open their eyes to where such barriers may make a path impassable. And I think those are really good examples of really important examples of how a freedom of information request could be used in this way to make sure a local authority in these cases 
that it installed barriers that actually stopped access, that it was able to be used to force almost immediate removal of those barriers, and also highlight that a local authority would expose itself potentially to further legal action if they didn't immediately recognize the problem and address the issue quickly. And so I think a number of people have been able to use FOIs to get those results in this regard. And it's an excellent tool to catalog and track those requests as well, things like what do they know, so that we can see if councils are routinely doing this. We see, like the NHS example, if there's a routine, the, the example Morris gave as well, a routine safety issue, but also in the case of how I use them as a parent during COVID, to also open the eyes of those bodies to the fact there may be a policy that in that depth of the, the pandemic, they weren't aware they had to comply with. So I think there's a transparency and also really critically for people, an opportunity to highlight and flag information and encourage good governance, transparency and openness. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. And again, some, some really wonderful examples there uh, of use. And, and again, I quite like that idea of surfacing things which an organisation may not even have known uh, that it was doing. Um, so we're now time for, for questions. We've got a lot of questions uh, that are, have come up. And it, can I invite all three of you to join me on screen so that we can we can see you all? I'm not going to try and answer them, um, but I think people want to see. So can I start off with a question from Terry Oxford? Uh, and so Terry's interested in the US. I expect this is really one for, for you, Gary, to start with. Are there any powers in the US that are working to shut down freedom of information uh, systems? Who are they and what are their interests? And then perhaps other colleagues, if you want to talk about the UK example or anything else you want to say, Gary. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are uh, a, a, a number of problems with our Freedom of Information Act and, and, and people who are trying to limit it in one way or another. Um, sometimes um, we see some uh, or, or organizations affiliated with scientists um, that are quite concerned and trying to limit the um, use of uh, uh, freedom of information laws to investigate scientists. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of problems with judges not taking the FOI laws seriously here in the United States, and um, just uh, being very um, supportive of, of uh, federal agencies or state agencies that don't comply. Uh, also, you know, many agencies just try to do as little as they possibly can, and these are scandals that bubble up all the time. Uh, right now, we're seeing a big one with respect to our, our National Institutes of Health being um, very, very much not willing to uh, respond to many freedom of information requests. Um, so, uh, yeah, there, there, that definitely exists. I mean, it's important for citizens to, to voice their support for the, for the Federal Freedom of Information Act and all 50 state Freedom of Information Acts. These things only exist because of the expenditure of some political will by a lot of people, and, and um, they, they certainly are not permanent. Mara, so does somebody want to comment on the UK comparison? How safe is it here? Um, our act has been um, under attack since before it was introduced. In fact, the Blair government threatened to pull the bill during its parliamentary passage if further improvements were made to it. Um, they said they would drop the bill altogether, and they they only um, didn't they only failed to do that because it, Blair himself had personally committed himself to this reform, and it was a Labour Party manifesto pledge. Um, and uh, Jack Straw's memoirs make clear that um, they were came very close to pulling the bill altogether if more improvements um, were made to it. The the pressure. Um, very often is from public authorities who uh, claim that um, they're being forced to spend a lot of time and resources dealing um, with multiple unserious requests. Uh, and they want to introduce, they, they think the solution to that is to introduce charges. Um, uh, but in fact, what has happened is that uh, the system has adapted to um, not only to allow requests to be refused because the cost limit is exceeded, but also where the cost limit isn't exceeded, but 
dealing with the request is too costly can be refused as vexatious. Now, a lot of people are unhappy about the extension of that concept to requests which are bur disproportionately burdensome. Um, but um, what it has done, it has diffused pressure from authorities for charges to deal with what they claim to be vexatious requests because authorities can refuse those requests out of hand. But that's where a lot of the pressure comes from. But we are safe for one of the problems that Gary um, identified of judges not being knowledgeable about FOI because requests are dealt with by the Information Commissioner's Office, which is a specialized body, and appeals go to a tribunal which is a specialized body, and from that tribunal to another specialized body, the upper tribunal. So it takes a lot for a, a request to get into the ordinary court system, and there are no charge, there are no costs involved uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, the, tr the commissioner or the tribunal. So that is helpful to the requester. So, so I mean, just to pick up on, on what Morris said. I mean. Um... Are there vexatious cases? I mean, we, we see in legal cases that there's slap litigation, which is designed to stop people being able to do things. Is freedom of information used to try to stop people from doing work that they should be able to do? Well, uh, some requesters think that if they can get all their supporters to make the same FOI request as they have done, so an authority has to answer 40, 50, 100, 200, almost identical requests. That will put pressure on the authority to stop doing what it is, what the requester doesn't like that it's doing, and change its policy. Um, but where a requester operates in that way, the tribunal rule has tended to rule that the request is vexatious for that reason, that the requests are not meant to put pressure on the authority directly. They are meant to be used to obtain information and you can use the information to put pressure on the authority, but not use the request as a form of battering ram. Um, but I mean, there are, you know, there are people who um, feel hard done by by something in their past and can't give it up and carry on making effectively the same request for the rest of their lives. And those tend to be treated as vexatious as well after a certain point. Sarah? I would also say I, as a researcher where I've used FOIs as a tool, I've had a request back to every single body I've worked with and have been working with regarding my research and emails where somebody hasn't been impressed with what we've revealed about them. And in many respects, those requests have been cultivated to have a chilling effect on the research. Those requests have been used because I'm at a public institution to try and create such a burden on my institution that they'll quash the research that I do. And what's really important is that many times those requests have actually fallen down because the individuals making them have been so fired up, they haven't actually bothered to learn how to make the request properly. So they haven't been formed in a way that required us to respond, for example, to provide the information because they weren't crafted and they well exceeded the time that it would take to do that. They were too all encompassing, they were poorly crafted. And in many respects, they were clearly vexatious. They were clearly designed to disrupt, chill, and also to keep me from asking critical questions that I think were really important about, in this case, um, corporate institutions' influence on policy practices, which many would call lobbying. Some may just say processes of influence, but in trying to investigate things that really just exposed the system. Um, and so I would say, there are absolutely people who misuse these, but I think they're fewer than the people who are using them for the social good. So I think it's really important that we preserve freedom of information and don't focus on those misuses, but to make sure we have good boundaries to stop them from being abused. Can I move us on to a, a question from Anne Galpin? Uh, so Anne Galpin says, in the UK, we have a new service specializing in disabled people's issues. Uh, and the, the Department for Work and Pensions has not been forthcoming in, in FOIs to the editor. And so there's an article in the Disability News Service where they've actually been warned by the Information Commissioner for systematically failing to comply with the law. 
always a good thing for government departments to do. Uh, and so Anne's first question is, would the speakers have any advice to people seeking this type of information? And can I also just throw in a particular question uh, for Gary about the US system? Because here we have an information commissioner's office. What is, is there an equivalent in the US and, and, and how does it work when there are problems? So, you know, one more UK based piece and one, one perhaps more US focused. I don't mind who goes first. So for the US based piece, the US system is very complicated because we have, um, we have a federal Freedom of Information Act that cover, covers the federal government, but we also have 50 state Freedom of Information Act uh, laws for each of the states. And so it's, it's, um, it's, each system works differently. And so it's quite hard to generalize over all 50. But um, you know, but 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 in general, uh, we don't work. Uh, we don't. Uh, there are some states that have information commissioner type uh, structures, but mo mostly um, we. Uh, when you appeal, you appeal to the agency, and then you go to a federal judge or a state judge. A complex picture. So in the UK, what's the advice for people trying to get the sort of information that the Disability News Service have been seeing? Well, Disability News is a fantastic um, user of FOI. They understand what they're doing. And one of the secrets is they understand the disability situation. They understand the regulations. They understand the problems. And they understand the Freedom of Information Act. And so that is a very good combination. There's nothing on the whole special about making a request about disability as compared to making a request about anything else. Uh, knowledge of the issue makes a big difference. And if you spend a little bit of time researching the issue before you make your request, that will strengthen the cha your chances. Uh, look at what has been disclosed by the authority you're interested in on that subject and look at what's been disclosed by other authorities on the same subject because that will show you what is realistic to expect and it makes it very more difficult for the authority to refuse your request. You're going to be forearmed about that the disclosure of this information uh, is common by other authorities. Uh, make sure your request is drafted in unambiguous terms. If your request can be read in several different ways, uh, or if it can be read in a way that is different from what is in your mind, you may end up getting the answer to an entirely different request from the one that you intend to have answered. Make sure it is information which the authority is actually likely to hold so that it's within their responsibilities. Make sure you know you can do something if you get the information. Ask yourself, so what? I mean, what if the answer is to this is zero? Uh, what if the answer to this is 5,000? I mean, what, what can you actually do something useful with the information? Uh, use the authority's own language and terminology to ask for the information. See how they describe the problem. That way you have a much greater chance of hitting the button you know, on the nose and be aware of asking for everything you can think of you possibly want about that topic because you are inviting a cost refusal if you do that. Now, it's difficult to judge where to draw the line, but you will very often see requests under the US Freedom of Information Act, which effectively ask for everything and they think of every option and add that to a list of sub requests. Um, now, in this country, that is uh, you in great danger of, of getting a cost refusal if you adopt that approach. So you, you do need to try to be moderate. And it's and it is a difficult job to do because you don't know where the boundaries are. It depends on how the authority holds its information. Sarah. And I would add to that as well. And I think that's excellent advice. I think the do your research is really important. I would say another thing as well is and I think it goes a long way to some of the successes I've had in getting large numbers of answers is be polite. <laughs> um, I think it's one thing we forget. A courteous tone can go a long way, even if you don't really love the authority and some of their policies, for example, it's still a person answering your request at the end of that email or form that you are filling in. And so I think be polite. But at the same time, um, know the exemptions and what's likely to be released or not released and be aware of these when you're tailoring that request. And if you haven't received a response or the response misapplies one of those, just remember that you can politely check in, you can politely ask for a review, 
you can do these kinds of engagements where you improve the likelihood of getting a response. I've had some very non-compliant NHS trusts who were clearly extremely overwhelmed with all the things that have hit the NHS in the past few years, but being polite, following up and saying, I still haven't received this. Um, I can say that persistence does sometimes pay off. And I mean persistence to where one non-compliant body did actually answer my request after 18 months, which I know Morris is going, is very unacceptable. But through working with them and actually exploring it and saying, I do eventually need this, it's not urgent, but I, I don't want to have to take you through this process and go to the information commissioner's office. And they explained very well why that wasn't to their hands and they were going to endeavour to do it all. We worked cooperatively and I ultimately did get the information that I needed and that actually ended up being a very educative process. So I would just say by crafting those effective re requests as Morris has kind of said, but also just remember that being polite and realizing it's a person is really important. So we've got a few more questions, uh, you know, time is always ticking. So can I ask a bit about sort of some excuses and also what we get back? So there's been a couple of questions uh, one says, one of the excuses used for not releasing information is commercial sensitivity. How well is this defined? Another excuse is information is going to be published soon. Is that defined? And if so, what does soon mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then also, how do we ensure the rigor and quality of the data we receive? How do we know that what we get back is actually right? Yeah. Well, uh, if I may, um... On, on the rigor and quality of the information, you have no right to good information. Uh, you have the right to the information which the authority holds. So that's a two-edged sword. Uh, it means that they cannot refuse the information on, uh, on the grounds that the information isn't of a disclosable quality. So if they've only got poor information, they have to disclose the poor information. And you, you, it's open to you to say, how can they possibly be doing their job in this area with information of this poor quality? But you can't require them to get better quality information under the Freedom of Information Act. Um, on uh, commercial sensitivity, the term is not defined. The test is whether disclosure, of course, uh, prejudice to commercial interests of a third party or of the authority itself. Uh, and the problem here is it is difficult for people who are not involved in uh, commercial activities to judge this uh, very well. Uh, you know, you, you, if you read some of the um, commissioner and tribunal decisions, you'll see that they uphold the refusal to disclose information which on the face of it, it looks to be completely innocuous in commercial terms. Things like, you know, uh, what level of insurance do you have against something going wrong? What is the penalty clause for not complying with this provision of the contract? Um, but uh, it turns out that there appears to be, or the tribunal, the commissioner uh, accepts that there is some commercial harm that could be caused by disclosing this. So I think the tip is, uh, either try and figure out what is really going on in that area, which is difficult, um, or just look for whether other authorities or the same authority, preferably, has previously disclosed that same information. So that is the best way without becoming specialized in it, uh, of looking at it and use things like, what do, you, what do they know, the website, which Sarah has referred to, um, look at authorities' own disclosure logs. A lot of authorities publish um, the requests and the answers they've given to requests. Uh, the www.gov.uk website publishes FOI disclosure, disclosures, which you can search for, and you can look at um, Information Commission tribunal decisions to see the discussion on some of these um, issues. Uh, and I think, you know, I mean, we've just got to make do with the fact that w on the whole, most requesters don't understand as much about commercial uh, considerations as the commercial company. Now, very often the problem is the authority doesn't understand either. And they just accept the public, they, the commercial bodies claim that something is commercially damaging to them. But you have a better chance with the commissioner and a much better chance when you get to the tribunal where basically you, you know, you get to see each other's submissions, you have the chance to re respond to them and so on. So 
so on on the question of how do, how do we know whether what we get back is actually complete and thorough, um, the, that, that's definitely a problem here in the United States and in many and many of our states. Um, in that, uh, oftentimes uh, people who, when you ask uh, for the documents of a certain person, they, they'll they'll actually be the person that responds to to the request, and that they'll they'll look through their own email. And lots of times that leads to the incentive of them not handing over um, emails or other documents that are relevant, um, but, um, but they don't want to hand them over. And then there are definitely um, employees uh, of federal and state governments who willfully disobey the freedom of information laws. I mean, there is just a big uh, case here that came to light maybe three weeks ago about a National Institutes of Health top staffer who um, was uh, deliberately shunting much of his sensitive political mail um, to his private email account and then um, deleting things that plainly should have been uh, subject to the FOIA um, and by the name of David Warren. So that, that, that sort of thing definitely happens. And um, you know, we need stronger tools, uh, both federally and in the states to make sure that uh, there is compliance even when there are political efforts to hide information. And I would just add to what you've both said there that um, in terms of the quality of content, I've had um, freedom of information responses specifically for data where I've collated that data, processed it, had a look at it, and then there's been a subsequent incident temporarily connected such that the data should be pretty much the same. There's been law enforcement action and the number of NHS trusts that said they were doing something and then the number that actually were involved in a product recall and law enforcement action, just, it, they, those two numbers did not match up. And so one knows one of those pieces of data is probably faulty. And so part of this for me is that that is actually in many respects what Gary said earlier, that's super interesting to me that like the records weren't being kept properly and the information wasn't um, being kept appropriately. And so there's a real, I think, learning thing in there that you can then say to that authority or that body or the NHS trust or whatever, in, in this particular case, it was the NHS, that there needed to be better data collection processes and better um, checks and balances to make sure that cases were recorded in an effective way that didn't rely on an incident um, getting to that level of law enforcement before it was actually captured adequately in the data. So I think it's, it, for me, the data being impure sometimes, I'm going to use that term, um, does actually open a space to discuss the proper implementation of things like policies or the proper things like purchasing agreements and also the recording of things and how we, we collect and collate that data. So there's a real opportunity sometimes in those failings. Other times it may just completely scupper what you're trying to achieve. And just very quickly, Sarah, soon, is that defined? Do we know when soon is? Maurice, do you have a definition yeah. soon? Because uh, I've so far seen very squiggly lines uh, around that one. Uh, the test is whether it's uh, it, the information is due to be published, is intended to be published, is held with a view to its publication in the future. It doesn't have to be soon. Uh, the uh, the in fact the publication date doesn't even have to be known by the authority the authority but the authority must have an intention which existed before the request was received to publish the request and it must be reasonable for the authority to withhold the information for until publication and the public interest test also applies uh, and so um, what happens is if the authority is about to publish annual statistics for something in three months time and you want them to publish the annual statistics now, the chances are that the information commission is going to uphold the exemption and say it's not, it's not great public in the public interest unless you can demonstrate great urgency to make the authority um, finish all its, its um, arrangements of verifying the data now. And getting it ready for publication now as opposed to in three months time but if there is a, th a deadline of, of some important kind for which the information is needed in terms of new legislation or a consultation then you may be able to say it's not reasonable for the authority to wait for an unspecified period of time until it's ready to, to publish the information 
And I would agree, it comes up a lot with consultations, doesn't it, Morris? Like there's a lot of times where consultations that that's it's one of the bases that you often have to go back on one of the responses you get to a request and say, hmm, do you want to revise that? Otherwise, I feel I'm going to need to go to the ICO. Um, so there's one question about what can one do if an institution doesn't comply? And I think the answer you've said is explore it, but then ultimately you can go to the ICO. Yeah. Can I finish with two questions? One which is pitched specifically at Morris and one for all of you. Um, so the, the, the one for Morris is from Dick Baxter, who, who yeah. writes, 30 years ago, I was responsible for putting environmental information in the law. Does Morris see this as a success at opening up FOI in general? I think it was a terrific success. And Dick, it's really nice to, to not be able to see you, but to know you, that you're <laughs> here. Uh, it was a terrific success. I mean, uh, how what the effect of Brexit on that will be is yet to be seen because there is a, this implemented an EU directive. We're no longer required to comply with the directive. It does the directive itself implements uh, an international treaty to which the UK is a signatory, and we are still bound by that. So, uh, but there there are opportunities possible that um, this will be weakened uh, as a result of. Brexit. But I mean, Dick Baxter coming on the scene here illustrates another important point, which is he, Dick was an example of a very pro disclosure civil servant. Um, and, you know, be aware that some of the FOI officers you're dealing with are the, you know, the focus of a pro disclosure argument within the authority. Sometimes they're up against everybody else who doesn't want to disclose the information. So it's another reason for following Sarah's advice, uh, not to piss off um, the, the, the individual you're dealing with, because that may be your one friend in the public authority, and a refusal you're getting may not be down to them, it may be down to, public, to people elsewhere in the authority. And I would also just add to that, not making them mad, that often if, if they aren't clear or if you have been polite and you have been a requester that has been very good in their conduct and shown good faith from your side, sometimes I've had people just pick up the phone and go, I'm actually, I don't know where I would find this information in my organisation. Often I'm in big NHS trusts for clarity. Who would I go to to find this and have a real conversation with me because they genuinely do want to help me get that information. And if you come in good faith, you ask something to build good practice or it shows a genuine desire to get good information, they'll work with you. Um, other times, if it's very antagonistic, I've seen requests just be like, you're being a problem child. And so there's a lot of, it makes a lot more barriers to me getting that information if, you, if somebody in our team's acted that way. So I just emphasize, little bit of sugar goes a long way. <laughs> so the, the thing I wanted to finish with is to ask each of you, if you could improve the way the whole system works for freedom of information, what one thing would you want to change? What would be your one top request? Um, Gary, can I start with you? Sure. I mean, the, the one thing that I would change about the system is, is not so much the legal part of it, but, but the, the civic infrastructure. Um, which underlies it, and that um, you know these are crucial tools for our democracy, but they only exist because people care about them and fight for them, and they only you know uh, give us fruit bear fruits because people file FOIA requests and care care about that and care about the public sphere. And so, to my mind, the most important thing is the way the citizenry looks at. Um, the FOIA as a tool for public good and as a tool for, for creating the society that we want and that we use it more. Fantastic. Morris? Um, I think I would, um, I, I would change the time limits, which are too flexible, too open-ended. And I don't actually question whether we need the internal review process at all because what what you find very often is um, the supposedly at least in central government uh, uh, internal review upholds the complainant in about 25 percent of cases partly or in full but that does not mean that in 25 percent of cases more information is disclosed i mean if you complain that the request has been not answered in time then uh, and 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 
it's taken more than 20 working days, your complaint is upheld on that. So quite a lot of the 25% are, are accounted by that. And if uh, you complain that the information is not exempt under the information under the exemption the authorities has cited, but uh, the information commission rules it's exempt under a different exemption, you still may not get any information, but your complaint has been upheld. I think if you subtracted all of those from the number of cases where complaints have been upheld, I think you may well find that a tiny number of complaints actually result in more disclosure. And the question is whether they simply serve to add to the delay rather than um, lead to greater openness. We have the value by, by the public. We have, you know, fixing the time delays. Sarah, final I'd words. I'd say more publicly accessible archives. So for me, one of the things that sits there is we've alluded to that there are some, but they're not comprehensive. They rely on the requester using it. Something like, what do they know? requires the requester to have used that platform. And Morris has alluded to the fact that there is some indexing on gov.uk and things like that, but they're not comprehensive. They don't catch everything and there's not kind of a centralized repository. More than that, I think allied to my point there about publicly accessible archives is that I think there should be more proactive disclosure of certain things like just publish the consultancy. If you've received submissions to a consultancy, publish them up front, don't make me go and request them to actually see what has been submitted and taken into account in that process, for example. So I think one of the things I would advocate for is more proactive publication, but I think allied to that, I'd also argue for that digital archive that allows the more centralization of information, because overall that's gonna reduce the burden on the public authority. If the default is just to publish this stuff, and I realize that's not going to work for everything. And I do realize there's questions around procurement and things like that, obviously. But a more proactive approach will just reduce the number of requests and make it easier for me to search. Has Joe Bloggs already submitted this? Am I replicating this? Am I wasting somebody's time? I think those are the big things that will reduce the burden on the public authority overall. And they'll make it easier for citizens and researchers and people like you and I to kind of find the information. Fantastic. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for tonight. So, so firstly, uh, Morris, Gary and Sarah, thank you very, very much for joining us. That has covered a lot of grounds, but there's a lot that we haven't had a chance uh, to look at. Um, and you'll be pleased to, on the 19th of September, there's a more in-depth workshop looking at how you can use freedom of information requests for the social good. Uh, Sarah's running that here in Cambridge at the Cambridge Central Library. I've hopefully just put into the chat the link for that. Um, and it will also be on the email you'll automatically get after this. So if you're interested in discussing this further on the 19th of September, please do come along uh, for that event. Otherwise, that's it from me. And, and again, thank you to, to our panel. Thank you so much for joining us. The next event from the IF, we're going to take a break for, for summer or whatever season we seem to be going through at the moment. Um, and our next event, we'll be looking at humour. So the 3rd of October, we'll be looking at what makes something actually funny. Hopefully see you then. Have a good time then. All the best. Bye.